And good afternoon, everybody. I wanna thank you all for inviting us in this conversation space today, for your joining us to be in spirit, to be in community, to be in knowledge with us. And that's what this session will be. It will be a community, it'll be a knowledge session. It'll be a conversation about ideas followed by dialogue. Particularly, I wanna thank my research team for their incredible commitment to moving equity work forward. Right now, doing this work isn't easy and we face attacks from all sides for caring about our babies, but this takes precedence, right? And we at the NYU Metro Center have not been deterred. Thank you, team. I also need to thank my many co-conspirators today in the audience for your incredible and visionary work, for your sense for the need for a conversation about returning to equity and justice in education from a research basis, for finding solutions from hearts and from homes. I know that you, you all aren't interested in my wax and philosophical, but you remain committed to producing the possibilities and the fruits of justice in our students' lives. And we at the NYU Metro Center have been honored, so honored to join you in this commitment. So I'm gonna thank each of you, no matter where you are standing or sitting, because without you, there would be no event. So thank you for all that you do and will do for advancing justice and education, but more importantly, for what you do for our children. As I now have said on countless occasions, I want you to know that you're not only the change, you're the hope, and might I add the inspiration. Again, I'm David E. Kirkland, Professor of Urban Education at New York University. We also serve as the Executive Director of the NYU Metro Center. My pronouns are he, him, and his, and I do want to acknowledge that I'm sitting on the unceded lands of the Lenape people. I do this in recognition to the land, and also as a reminder that struggles for justice continue because we're all on occupied land. So I believe deeply that we must reconcile with ourselves and others a project of remembrance. We must do this while we also engage the revolution, revolutionary work of recovery, which is the opposite of cultural and social deletion, two incredible projects of human subjugation that education at its best seeks to interrupt. Today, we're gonna talk about more than what, what should be happening in our schools. We're gonna talk about solutions for returning to justice in our hearts and our students' lives for their destinies, which is about furthering our understanding of culturally responsive education. Today's conversation will be about the students who sit in front of us, students like Maya, whether they're on screens or in person, it doesn't matter. The question is, how do we center them? How do we value them? How do we know and understand them? How do we hear from them? We're going to talk about what's needed to get to know them and develop meaningful relationships with them while engaging their communities and their community cultural wealth, because this is how we truly transform their educational outcomes. We're going to talk about how culturally responsive education must also be sustaining. That is, it must work to encourage cultural pluralism and not just cultural assimilation. The goal isn't to use our students' cultures, our cultures to move us outside of it, but to design education experiences that sustain our students and us within it. Because culturally responsive sustaining education begs the question, how do we welcome our babies into learning and preserve them beyond it? As an educator and as a researcher, I want us to hold high expectations for our students, but I also want us to hold the latter because what good are high expectations if students lack the support that's needed to meet them? King said, it's all right to tell a person to lift themselves by their own bootstraps, but it's, but it's a cruel jest to say to a bootless man that he ought to lift himself by his own bootstraps. It's grossly unfair to expect our students to ascend to places we have not lifted them to. So that's the question. How do we lift them as we climb? How, do, how does culture have real consequences for our students and their learning? How do, does their identities have real consequences for our children and their learning? The question of culture, the question of racial identity and its formation sits at the center of any meaningful conversation about education. It sits, at, it sits at the center of how we might imagine an educational reality that works for all of our children. So 
That's the conversation. Because over the past year, our team, guided by the ever insightful wisdom of a youth advisory board, has studied and learned from five amazing and pioneering organizations that hold secrets to educating our children. These organizations include Sadie Nash, Urban Word, Kingmakers of Oakland, Facing History in Ourselves and Exalt You. Each of these organizations has a long track record of serving our most vulnerable youth and with success and unparalleled grace. They all in their own ways have embraced culturally responsive sustaining education and have provided secrets for teaching our children particularly those students we still struggle to teach. These organizations hold keys for helping us to understand how to equip our children and our schools with the things necessary to challenge barriers to learning rooted in deep histories of bias and structural inequity. By studying these organizations, we at NYU Metro Center have learned a lot and have been able to produce valuable qualitative insight into how the impact of culturally responsive sustaining programs centered around improving youth, um, improving students' experiences in school can be scaled, can be learned from, can be leveraged to improve education at large. Today, you will hear from our research team about our findings. You'll also hear a conversation candidly with the org lead leaders we've listened to. And if we're lucky, you get to hear from the youth themselves. So let's begin. Dr. Elise Harris Wilkerson will introduce our research team who will be presenting our findings and recommendations for transforming education for our leaders. Elise. Hi everyone. Again, I am Elise Harris Wilkerson and I'm just so excited to be here today and to share a bit with you about what we've learned. And so I'm the Associate Director of the Center for Policy Research and Evaluation and I am the project manager for the research side of this incredible project. I'm joined here today with um, my amazing colleagues who will be presenting information and what we've learned from these amazing organizations. And so first up, um, I just want to introduce Dr. Wendy Pettis, Tiffany Martinez, Dr. Kelly Gilpin, Lindsay Foster, Sarah McAllister, and Dr. Cecilia Ponther, as well as Sydney Miller. They all come from different um, backgrounds with different expertise, all putting their minds together to help us understand, um, collect, and analyze data from a range of sources, um, including observations from five community practice meetings, um, interviews from a range of staff that belong to each of the five organizations that participated in this project, as well as observations from the organizations that participated. So any events that they may have had or um, program um, observations that they may have had, we've attended those and took in field, taken field notes. And then finally, uh, we've analyzed a range of artifacts from the five organizations. And so our research question, um, well, there are multiple research questions for this project, but the one that we're going to focus on today really is looking at the keys for understanding what are the strategies, the practices, um, culturally responsive practices that get at the secret sauce, right? What are the, what is the secret sauce behind what these organizations are doing, right? And so we are so pleased to share our initial findings that lift up how the participating organizations engage in culturally responsive and sustaining approaches that affirm students for who they are and that challenge the deep history of racism and intersectional racial bias that students face in their schools. So now, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Pettis. Thank you so much. So thanks everyone. It's so great to be here with you all. Um, we're gonna go ahead and advance the slide to the findings. Thank you so much. So one of um, our findings that we had that was very important was that the organizations are, there are spaces that are curated for BIPOC youth. So in these spaces, spaces, they're encouraging youth to bring their full selves to the space and acknowledging their intersectional identities. So whether it be their racial and ethnic identities, their gender identities, these spaces are ones where they're encouraged, BIPOC youth are encouraged to bring all of that to the table, all of that to the space. Um, and also there's a lot of focus on the self, getting to know who they are, 
getting to know their stories, getting to know about their experiences. Um, so that's really important for the spaces that are created with these organizations. There's also creation of safe and brave spaces to, be, to meet the evolving needs of participants and also response, responsive to, responsiveness to youth is prioritized. And so these spaces are places where youth can talk about things that can be difficult. They may have had some hard experiences um, or something that they've wanna share that they don't feel like they can share, honestly, sometimes in schools. And so not only is trust created, but also there's courage to share. Um, and um, not only that, but these spaces are responsive to the needs of BIPOC youth. And so one example is just the pandemic. These organizations really, you know, they it wasn't as if the pandemic wasn't happening. There was conversations about it. There was support. Um, there was also sometimes funding to families who needed it. And so there's just this ability to respond to what youth are going through in these spaces. Um, and lastly, youth voice is encouraged and emotions are welcomed, and this is their space to co-construct. So whether youth have um, a leadership role, like a formal role um, or not, they are very much reflected in these spaces. They're encouraged to speak, they're encouraged to, to take leadership, to plan events, again, even if they're not in a formal role, but to really put their mark on these spaces because they, these spaces are for them. And so it's really the true meaning of co-construction. Um, and so now I want to turn it over to my colleagues, Tiffany and Sarah, to give us some examples of this. Thank you so much, Wendy. So we'll see here in these quotes that there's an emphasis from the organizations in which we collaborated with of centering the young person. In the first quote, we'll read, you know, realizing that you can be successful, accepted, loved, cared for, challenged, engaged, and you don't have to, you know, you can do that while kind of bringing your full self, whatever that means into the space. In our second quote from Exalt, we could read, we always begin the very first day of class in our curriculum with the school to prison pipeline lesson, not where we teach the young people about what we believe the school to prison pipeline is, but where we ask them, you know, what was this thing? Why are there police in your neighborhoods, in your schools? And so we can see from these quotes that not only is there a centering of the young person, but also this credibility of experience, that the experiences of the young people are valid. They are knowledge. And I'll pass it over to Sarah before presenting the rest of our findings. Thank you. Um, my colleagues and I had the privilege of um, learning from materials and artifacts that the community of practice organizations are able to share. Um, Lindsay, can you advance this slide? Thank you. Um, the artifacts that we um, we looked at made it clear that our community of practice um, organizations constantly attend to the spaces that they create for young people and co-create with young people. Through materials, um, throughout the materials, there's an implicit and explicit acknowledgement that space making and space maintaining require diligence, nimbleness, and care. Um, for example, the Sadie Nash Leadership Project's um, siblinghood model cultivates safer spaces for young leaders where they can be vulnerable, bring their, their full selves and their full identities into their work together, and take responsibility for attending to each other's safety. Um, one Nasher described her experience in this space as her sacred time. Um, similarly, urban words workshops um, have a rhythm that begins with a room opener, a performance, an energizing game, et cetera, a warm up, which is a free right to get the blood flowing and yet long, let young people bring themselves and their experiences of the week into the room. And then with a room closer to transition out of the creative space while taking the energy of the workshop along with them. Um, we think these practices speak a bit to kingmakers of Oakland's metaphor of treating the toxic ecosystem to heal the fish. So they correctly locate the problem in the toxic spaces and ecosystems that black and brown young people navigate daily. Um, and work to create the conditions, writ small or large, that allow young people to claim and embrace their own gifts and experiences. Um, these practices put us in mind of the scholar Nayla Nasir's call for spaces that challenge the racial storylines that are dominant and unexamined in our schools and other, other institutions. Um, so by cleaning up and protecting these sacred spaces where young people can explore their identities on their own terms, um, our community practice organizations are opening up new identities and possibilities for young people. Thank you, Sarah. I'm gonna now jump into our second finding. Um, so thank you, Lindsay. So our second finding was that um, relationships come before content. So our staff really, so the, the organizational staff really set the tone for a culture of care where love for BIPOC youth was cultivated. 
Um, and there's three ways that they did this. So one of the ways was that they took holistic views of success for students um, that are used to support their whole person, including social emotional learning. And so wellness mattered. How are these students feeling? How are these BIPOC youth feeling? How are they doing? What are they experiencing? That mattered. But even though there was also some, a lot of learning going on in different ways, because there was, for example, a lot of literacy, um, whether it be a case study on history, whether it be um, writing poetry, reading, reading literature together, um, or real world, real world experiences like through internships. So there's a lot of different kind of learning and success that was accessible to BIPOC youth. Um, we, the staff also viewed BIPOC youth as leaders and wanted to learn from their lived experiences. So, you know, BIPOC youth were seen as some, some more, they're leaders now, they're kings and queens, they're given so much credit, so they're, you know, the lenses are asset-based, so much knowledge, knowledge is coming in from the BIPOC youth that staff is truly values um, and up, uplifts. And so that it was just very clear through all of our findings how important that was. Um, and the, the last piece of this is that the organizations do carefully choose their staff that align with their mission and goals, and they also provide ongoing support. So they really try to find staff that have these beliefs where they center young people, where they believe in BIPOC youth, um, and also provide ongoing support. And so that could be, um, you know, professional development, for example, it could be, but it could also be um, collective learning. Um, so when staff, you know, could read the same, for example, uh, Freire is really big with a lot of critical consciousness work. And so it could be reading Freire together, or it's just conversations between the leaders of, of the organizations and staff and, and ongoing growth that's happening to make sure that BIPOC youth are getting what they need. Um, and so, so now I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to my colleagues, Tiffany and Sarah, to provide some examples. Thank you, Wendy. So something beautiful about this finding and that centering of relationships and the power of relationships and creating, you know, these connections with these young people. As a former youth worker myself, I can tell you that young people know when you're not being authentic. They know when you're not being genuine. And uh, there's this authenticity in all of the work that we've been able to evaluate that I found very aligned with this finding. So a few quotes that we have here, one from Exalt is, we understand the young people are teaching us. And that kind of circles back to the credibility of experience note that I mentioned earlier. The second quote is, and so you know, I think it starts with staff and building honesty. I think it comes with questioning the systems that exist in their school and how those systems are rooted in white supremacy. And our last quote here is, we all get it right. We hire for attitude, we train for skill, meaning I can't teach you to love black children. Like that comes in, but if you love black children, I can teach you accelerated learning. And you'll see in these bolded words, we have a triangulation between understanding, honesty, and love. Thank you. And I'll pass it on to Sarah. Thank you. Um, one a central theme that emerged from the artifacts was um, the idea of nimbleness that adults and staff truly see the young people in front of them and have the time and space and knowledge and love to respond to what they're saying and what they need. Um, we saw that organizations shifted very nimbly to online platforms during the pandemic and were able to recenter trauma informed care um, and self care practices for both their staffs and for the young people they work with. Um, we see this in Sadie Nash's Siblinghood Academy model, which uses a family metaphor for collective care and accountability. Um, Facing History in Ourselves has created a rich set of resources to support teachers and students who are returning to the classroom during the ongoing COVID pandemic to build deep and sustaining relationships that will um, foster the kind of work they need to do together. Um, so many of the lessons and materials and trainings that we looked at really center empathy. Um, so, you know, empathy for young people, helping young people develop empathy for one another and for others, and most importantly, cultivating the expectation of empathy and love in BIPOC youth themselves. Thank you, Sarah. So now we're going to go to our last finding. So we're going to be talking about um, joy, catharsis, and imagining new realities. And so um, we found that organizations fostered critical consciousness through their dialogue. 
So, and, and other ways as well, but one of the ways was through conversations that they had. And so what organizations did is they worked with BIPOC youth to reframe deficit narratives, to really interrogate systems of oppression, and also to imagine new ways of being. And so if BIPOC youth were experiencing some of the realities that, for example, Elise mentioned, um, we, we see how these were counter to that, counter spaces to that. Um, and also these organizations used art as self-definition and self-celebration to counter assumptions made about BIPOC youth. So rather than organizations telling BIPOC youth who they were, um, they allowed them to define themselves and also to celebrate, to see what is good and joyful. And so that was really important and one method that was done. Um, there was also storytelling um, in the service of catharsis and transformation to turn pain into healing. And so even if there were difficult things to talk about and experiences, those won't, are not ignored in these spaces. They're, they're talked about in safe and supportive ways. And there's also healing that is uh, involved with that. Um, and so now I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to my colleagues, Tiffany and Sarah, and they'll share some examples for this last finding. Absolutely. So in this facing in history and ourselves quote, it reads, so whenever we are in spaces with them, we try to model humility. We try to model collaboration and self-reflection, knowing that critical self-reflection is key in culturally responsive classroom management. We acknowledge that we all have common goals in education. Ideally, we're here because we want to empower students. Before I move on to the next quote, I want to emphasize that word empower and how we notice in the data that not only are these organizations creating spaces for young people to sit with their own narratives, to critically self-reflect, but using this as a jumping off point to maybe even change the narratives to come, to become advocates in their own communities. In the second quote from Urban Word, we read, so sometimes it is the wider conversation, then it always has to come back home. You know, that's kind of the thing that's missing from histories traditionally. It's like these wider things just happen and they have no effect on anybody. And also there's a whole bunch of voices not even talked about a part of this, like occurrence in history. And this speaks to centering of the young people's experience, what they're going through, even if it's not necessarily discussed and spaces created in traditional classrooms. Thank you, and I'll pass it on to Sarah. Excuse me for the background noise, I'm in the Bronx here. Thanks, Tiffany. Um, the artifacts we're going to talk about here really, um, I think, illustrate the power of art and um, storytelling um, for joy and catharsis. Um, Urban Word anchor poems and student work um, use a lot of visual and sensory imagery celebrating physical markers of racial identity and thick evocations of place and time to represent community. You heard that today so powerfully in Maya's poem with the opening of our time together. Um, I wanted to share just a fragment of an anchor text that's used in a words, at words and verbs workshop um, by Elizabeth Acevedo. She took all of the stereotypes and put them in a chokehold and they breathed out the truth. Um, and we've seen that again and again through students work from across the organizations of really transforming stereotypes and, and negative experiences into joy and beauty. Um, we also find we also saw this finding embodied in the consistent emphasis on performance over perfection and performance as connection um, as a collective experience of creation and experience that makes something new out of the raw materials of experience. Um, facing history and ourselves um, guides teachers to facilitate a lesson using storytelling in an example of um, identity development and affirmation. Um, they use the following excerpt from Michelle Obama's Becoming. There's power in allowing yourself to be known and heard in owning your unique story and using your authentic voice. And there's grace in being willing to know and hear others. This for me is how we become. We felt this quote really um, exemplified so much of the work that's happening in each organization um, of telling your own unique story um, and in being willing to know and hear others. Um, in the Facing History and Ourselves example, um, the unit goes on to ask teachers and students to develop life roadmaps um, acknowledging that societal and individual behavior results from lives lived as a journey or story, including multiple context decision points and experiences. Thanks.
Okay, so bringing it all together, what are the lessons that we learned from today's um, presentation, right, of findings? And so as we put it all together, we believe that the following are some practices um, that youth serving folks um, can employ or even educators um, can employ when they are working with and serving BIPOC youth. So the first one is the place students at the center. So when we think about the programs that participated, so Sadie Nash, Urban Word, all of the organizations, they had a deep respect for who young people are um, and they empowered them and just made space for the young people to um, sort of just show up, be themselves and to lead. You know, young people are very powerful in the sense that they are pushing culture, they create culture. And so just centering young people, their voices and what they bring to the table can really be a leverage for or, or entry point into designing programs. The second point is to cultivate staff that demonstrate love and understanding of BIPOC youth. So when we think about um, the five organizations that participated um, in this project, it was clear that, you know, love and understanding was present and not love in the ooey gooey emotion sense, but that is part of it, but we're talking about empathy, being able to sit with the difficulty of a moment, being able to um, deeply listen to young people. That relationship that is at the core of love is represented among these organizations. And that goes to the second, or excuse me, the third point around navigating difficult realities, whether they're personal or systemic with young people while they're, while also focusing on their strengths and fostering moments of joy. So being able to walk that balance that, you know, young people experience multiple forms of marginalization in, in their schools or in society as a whole. However, those experiences are not the totality of who young people are, BIPOC people are. BIPOC people, uh, young people are always um, sort of young people are always creating and there's always a sense of joy. They are bigger, better, stronger than any system that is trying to um, keep them down. So just focusing on that joy and who they are beyond their um, discriminatory experiences is a part of um, the work as well. And then create partnerships between schools and youth serving spaces that center culturally responsive and sustaining learning opportunities. So when we think about schools, right, oftentimes we think about the actual schoolhouse, but schools are embedded in communities that are full of families and important people, spiritual leaders, um, important trusted uh, folks who um, are important not only to the school, but to the broader community. And when we think about organizations as a part of the school community, we can learn lessons, leverage and partner with organizations. Uh, schools can partner with organizations so that um, they learn how to do these things, these things that I just mentioned within school. So of course, we want educators and folks in the schoolhouse to be able to center youth, demonstrate love and understand BIPOC youth, strengthen and foster uh, moments of joy within the classroom, be able to empathize and listen deeply. Those are all competencies that we believe that are transferable and very possible for the education space um, in the formal schoolhouse. In addition to that, it is important to lean on community organizations as well um, as they are they are bright spots in knowing how to um, sort of work with young people in ways that are free and they are unencumbered like some of the schools are as it pertains to requirements and things of that nature. So those are the five lessons that um, we sort of have extracted from. Um, today's presentation, the findings, and there are a lot more findings, um, but we only have so much time to present today and the final report will come out later on at the end of the year. And we encourage you all, once we get it together, we'll definitely share it out. Um, but now uh, I would invite you all to ask us any questions you might have about our research project process and the findings um, that we've presented to you all today. So feel free to drop them in the chat and I'll give you all a moment if you have any questions. Yes, so I see 
a question around will participants receive a copy of this webinar? I'm not sure if each person gets a copy of the webinar, but I know that we will um, post it and it is being recorded. So um, Kimberly, we'll get back to you to confirm whether or not it'll be sent directly to participants. Thank you, Tanae. So in the meantime, as um, the audience is um, writing questions, I do have some questions for the team for you all to sort of like respond to. So a lot of this work, we talk about sort of thinking about the collective space. Um, we think about how do adults, how do folks who are cultivating spaces, create spaces for young people to thrive. And we're, we've talked a lot about um, BIPOC students in CRSC practices, but did you all see any clear lines around, did you all see any clear lines around sort of racial identity development? Can you speak to um, what are the ways in which racial identity development was fostered through this, through this work? I can take that. I can take it that first and then whoever wants to jump in from the research team. Um, yeah, I mean, I think specifically when just the exploration of some of these systems and histories and self, I think that uplifts a lot of racial identity exploration because that is a really big part of the identity of BIPOC youth. And so by by asking, you know, BIPOC youth to bring their whole selves in. Um, that I think is a part of it. So that is a part of what we saw. So it's a lot of times, you know, there, there's other spaces that don't really want to talk about, for example, your racial identity, what that means, experiences connected to that. And so in the exploration of self um, that all these organizations do, and for example, for facing history, that educators model for um, BIPOC youth, um, and educators explore their, their self as well and their experiences. And so in a part of that, it really does focus at, and incorporate racial and ethnic identity. Um, and it and it carries out because there's also specific emphasis on looking at, for example, racism, like when you think about oppression. So it's there are some explicit emphases on these topics that also bring in those conversations and lived experiences. Um, and you can see how there's there's that sort of cultivation of that and growth of that, you know, so it's like they are not able to talk about this in other environments, but here they explore that and are given, you know, tools to talk about it and sort of that support, not only from staff, but the peers that are in that group. And so I think that's sort of some specific ways that racial ethnic identity were developed sort of in the midst of this exploration of self and systems and really explicit conversations about race and, and ethnicity. Um, so that's just some of um, some thoughts, but love for others to share from the team if they have other. I would echo everything that, that Wendy said. I'd also add that the organizations are very authentic in giving the participants space to name identity for themselves. And so whether someone is experiencing um, a, an event that is causing them to reshape the way that they see their racial and ethnic identity development, if they are in a space of joy and affirmation, or if they're just in a space of processing, I feel like each of the organizations was very intentional about allowing the students to name those things for themselves, uh, rather than attributing deficit or struggle or trauma. Um, there was just a lot of love uh, in this culture of care so that the participants can be who they are uh, as they are in that moment and then let the uh, developmental elements um, that we recognize from uh, a lot of ethnic and racial identity de um, development models really emerge for the students in their own time. Thank you, Cecilia. Thank you, Wendy. So we have some questions in the Q&A and the chat. Um, and so Wilhelmina asks, were there any discussions about how schools can be oppressive buildings in their nature and restrictive of cultivating joy and how to combat that? And then Wilhelmina's 
follow-up question was um, also how to empower BIPOC youth that only value themselves in their proximity to whiteness, especially immigrant youth. So were there any sort of um, evidence within the data that discussed, you know, schools being oppressive spaces that might um, sort of smother joy from young people? Um, yeah, I'd say there's, um, there's some, I think, both implicit and explicit critique of the way schools are usually structured, right, and the, and the way learning usually happens um, that um, really doesn't center the lived experiences of, of BIPOC youth um, or make space for the kinds of critical, you know, critical consciousness and the kinds of really authentic conversations that might be happening in these organizations. Um, you know, I think the that each organization has sort of a different relationship to schools, right? Some are completely outside of schools. Some are providing curriculum to schools. Some are sort of, you know, working within the system. So, um, but I do think there's a lot of critique of um, the way that attention to, you know, a very narrow set of outcomes has really, um, uh, you know, allowed schools to sort of become oppressive spaces where, you know, traditional racial storylines aren't challenged and, um, you know, black and brown young people don't have a lot of opportunities for exploring their identities. and, and Experiencing joy. I don't. I don't want to uh, sort of overstep the lines into the next part of our presentation, but uh, or the next part of the conversation with the youth advisory board. But that was um, some uh, something that we heard loud and clear from the youth advisory board when we shared our findings with them was about um, how differently, like sort of, you know, learning opportunities are received based on the space that they're in, right? Like, so we we presented some examples of curriculum that some of the um, community practice organizations used, and they said, well. I would definitely engage with this in some spaces and I would totally shut down in other spaces, right? Specifically in some of my classes that, that you know, the, the, that young people's receptiveness to certain kinds of learning really depends on the kind of spaces that they're in. And there's a lot of contrast between sort of traditional schools and these kinds of spaces. Thanks, Sarah. All right, just wait and see if there were other folks on the research team who want to respond, but thank you for that. All right, so there's one question in the chat about um, measuring success. And so TT asks, um, as these organizations focus on fostering positive relationships and centering joy, how do they go about measuring how well they do these things? So was there any sort of evidence in the data around measuring um, success or how well they do the amazing work that they do. I think that, so, and, you know, others will share as well. So with our evidence, there was conversations and, you know, in the data about sort of like those measures of success, where it's like the traditional measures, which is like academics and thinking about some of like how BIPOC youth are doing in school. And while there are some conversation about that, um, there's also this idea of other ways to measure like how well students are doing. And so, for example, it could be, you know, like we're talking about Urban Word, like it's it's that they're writing poems. It's like how many poems they're writing and, and sort of that production piece, um, like the events, how many, you know, are they attending events? And and again, and, and I think Chanel can speak more to that specifically to when they share, but it's this idea of, of measuring some of like their engagement and what they're a part of, but not necessarily, you know, it doesn't always have to be like grading it as, for example, like a grade, you know, A, B, or C, or even with like the internship um, opportunities, for example, that Exalt does. So there's an idea of that it's it's that their experience is like, what are they learning? And there's a lot of I think the, the measures of success are are some of those experiences and what they're, you know, what they're learning from that the BIPOC youth, but it's done with in, in different ways like assessments, um, conversations. Um, and so those are some different ways where the, the measures are success is like what is being produced can be seen if, if they're producing things like we're, we're seeing some art, um, some lived experiences captured in stories and things like that. But also, you know, the programmatic experiences like internships um, or, but then there's more probably, you know, some connections to, not probably there are connections to schooling to, to some degree. So each organization, not all organizations, but um, some organizations do have those connections to schools where they use those traditional measures of, of success. Um, so I think that is like, there's a broader conversation of what the measures are um, than just sort of those academic 
you know, buzzwords that people usually talk about. Um, so yes, there is evidence that there are academic measures, but there's also like other measures of success, like the ones I mentioned. I wanted to, you know, kind of just jump in, you know, with the research team, you know, I'm around this question because I think it's an important question, you know, on that TT, you know, on Max, and that is, you know, um, how, what, what did we learn about ways that we can define success differently? And I think that that was one of the big questions, you know, um, that we've taken from the research. You know, not only are the organizations thinking about school related success, how to, how to get kids to graduate, you know, Chris put a, um, a link in the chat about, you know, um, decreased dropout rates from Oakland Kingmakers. So, I mean, there, is, there are the traditional kind of like, like success metrics, you know, um, readiness, school readiness, Urban Word looks at things like literacy and the relationship with literacy. Um, we, we've all looked at, you know, um, questions about, you know, kind of like academic performance, you know, what happens with these young people. Urban Word looks at transitions, how many kids actually go to, you know, um, college who um, sign up with, um, for their program, and they have these astronomical rates. But the thing that was clear across all these groups was the necessity to, find, to define success differently. It's not that, you know, um, the academic or traditional bar isn't something to meet it may not be the bar or the only bar where the program has impact. And so when Wendy talks about some of the social and emotional impacts, some of the mental health and um, structural impacts, right? Students feel, feeling like they're in spaces where they can exhaust um, um, racial trauma, for example, or you know, intersectional gender trauma that they feel becomes another really important piece. Tanae and you know, Sadie Nash, they talked about the ways the girls showed up and not only showed up, but were, um, had a way in a place you you know, um, to develop themselves that felt safe. So safety becomes a metric. And we began to look at all of these other kinds of things. There are two things in relationship to these kinds of things. One is that when you begin to look at safety as a metric, it's related to all the traditional metrics of success, academic outcomes, attendance in school, you know, um, healthy, striving learning environments to success, but it's also related to things outside of school. Whether or not you're gonna, you know, um, live a healthy, full, and fulfilled life, and so as this kind of notion or recognition of what it means to be successful expands, we begin to see that these young people were in situations beyond just their school success or where their school success would be defined, but their life success could be defined. The last thing is is that the other thing is that the metrics of school success, just academic technical pieces didn't get at what it meant to be successful in school. Things like joy became a, you know, a definition of success, like the research team said. Things like healthy and affirming spaces. You know, so if you have a classroom that cultivates a space that students want to be in, where they feel that they, they belong, the metric of success is the measurement of belonging. Mm -hmm. If I might just add one, one quick thing. Um, this is said explicitly by some of our organizations, Sadie Nash comes to mind in particular, but that idea of relationship um, and how we measure success by the strength of the relationship, both from peer to peer, from say mentor or mentee um, to participant, uh, but also in the relationships when we see them supporting each other through different through different deliverables, right? So whether it is a course assigned, whether it's an assignment related to specific curriculum, whether it's um, an artistic expression, seeing each other show up for each other and then being able to use those skills um, in their communities um, and, and in their schools as well was something that really stood out consistently through the findings. All right, thank you. So I see a hand up and I see a lot of questions in the chat that are very um, practice oriented. And I'm not sure if the research team is the best uh, team. I feel like these are like really important questions for the actual organizations. One of them is about like tools and frameworks that the organization uses um, to assess whether the, um, the youth members participate have strong voice and agency um, and things of that nature. And we have folks on the call who 
um, can speak directly to those things. Um, the research team, if you want to speak to some of the tools that you all saw come up in the data, that's fine. But some of these questions are uh, very practice oriented and we have the voices of the folks who do the work here. Um, so I just want to open the floor to any other sort of like um, questions about our process before we turn it over to Dr. Kirkland um, for a panel discussion with the five organizations. See any other questions coming through? And well, if there are, there, there's one question, Elise, about um, you know from an anonymous attendee. Um, the anonymous attendee asks, you know, what was the proportion of BIPOC staff? Did you notice a connection with BIPOC staff and their ability to connect with, you know, um, BIPOC youth? Was there a specific learning that white staff engaged in to better connect with? Um, BIPOC youth, you know, and, um, the, the question, the question is a racial match question, and I think it's an important question, right? You know, did these organizations succeed because they were um, staffed by, you know, on people of color? Um, and I think that that's an important question. And the other part of the question is the extent to which, you know, um, white staff, you know, can learn, you know, um, from, a, from a, the strategies and approaches you know, um, that were in place in these spaces. One thing that we can say, you know, having conducted the research, having sat in the community of practice groups, you know, um, all year long, you know, we're talking about predominantly people of color, you know, um, who are producing, you know, um, intervention as well as, you know, um, innovation for students within their communities, right? You know, um, and so the, 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 the racial match research suggests that students learn more, that students trust better when they have opportunities to learn from, student, from teachers who share some kind of common experience with them. And many of the organizations that we you know, looked at, all of the organizations that we looked at, you know, um, were staffed by you know, um, you know, Black, Indigenous, people of color, you know, um, as well as individuals who come from those groups. And I think that that piece of the research is extremely important, right? That, that part of the solution, right, of creating joy, of creating space, of, you know, um, enlisting, you know, um, our young people, right, means that we also have to enlist the people who, who are part of their lives and who know them, who know them most. That part of the listening is partnering with, you know, um, partnering with people, you know, um, who look like, feel like, can relate to, you know, um, these young people. Is that exclusive only to you know young people um, to people who share you know race and ethnicity? It's not, but the race and ethnicity question, the racial identity question, is extremely important from this research as well as from a lot of other research that we've seen. Now, what can you know um, you know white educators take from you know, this in terms of working with you know um, non-white students? Well, place the young people at the center, you know, as the lessons you know, from our findings suggests, you know, demonstrate love and understanding of these young people, focus on their strengths and foster moments of joy and partner with them, you know, um, both within and beyond school spaces, right? These are things regardless of your racial makeup you can do, right? The question becomes, how do you show up when you show up in, in these spaces and the authenticity of the construction and the performance of things like love, you know, um, for these young people. The thing that we've learned from the five organizations that we work with, that these young people respond to love. They respond to safe and caring spaces. They respond when they feel they have a stake, when, when we are in partnership with them. And I believe, regardless of, you know, what color your skin is, you know, um, if you're able to do those things authentically, you know, um, those young people will respond to you too. Thank you so much, Elise, you know, for that. And thank you, panel, you all did an amazing job. Um, I wanna, we're, we're gonna transition to another panel conversation. Elise talked about um, having an opportunity to talk to and ask questions of the uh, organizations that we work with. And I wanna take this opportunity to give you all an opportunity to speak with me. 
So I'm going to speak with the, the um, five organizations or leaders from the five organizations. Um, just brief questions. And then I want to give the audience an opportunity to have a conversation with them too. Please use the question answer feature that's part of your Zoom or write your questions via chat. You can post questions at any time during this conversation, you know, um, and we'll try to get to every question that we can. If we do not get to your question, we're going to try to make, you know, um, answers to your questions available through a follow up email as well as hopefully, you know, um, a sharing of our slide deck. There won't be any slides for this conversation because it is a conversation and it's meant to be, you know, um, it's meant to be personal. First, let me thank, you know, um, the five organizations, Exalt, you know, Facing History and Ourselves, Kingmakers of Oakland, Exalt Youth, Urban Word NYC, and Sadie Nash for joining me today. From Exalt Youth, we have Chanel Gabriel, Executive Director. No, we don't have Chanel? I'm not from Exalt Youth, I'm from Urban Word. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, from Urban <laughs> Word, we have Chanel Gabriel. From Exalt Youth, we have Giselle Castro. From Sadie Nash, we have Tanae Howard. From Kingmakers of Oakland, we have Chris Chapman. And we have my buddy Steve Beckton from Facing History and Ourselves. Thank you all so much for joining me in this conversation. And thank you all for a whole year of learning. Um, let me just begin, right, you know, um, with, with one question. And that is, you know, what did you take from this experience? You all, you all were with us for a year and we were listening and learning from you all. You all presented, you know, um, your best practices. You all presented your model to us. You all did all these things. You all allowed us to come and ask you questions afterward, grab all of the things that you all created and put in place. And you all have something to teach. You all have something to learn, but you all experienced something too. How was it? being part of a community of practice with like minds for over a year. And I'll let anyone, you know, who wants to start us off, start us off. Steve. I'll, yeah, I'll jump in. The, the thing that has stuck with me the, the most is, is uh, the personal journey. You know, I, I've been doing this, this kind of work for about 20 years. And I, I look back, uh, David, and this is perhaps the first time in all those 20 years that I've, I have been this deeply immersed with other BIPOC people doing the work. And that just kind of surprised me, having done this work 20 years, that I haven't had the opportunity to have this kind of deep immersion. This, this work can be lonely at times. Um, uh, as a BIPOC person doing the work, uh, finding uh, a, a, a sense of community, a, a sense of support, uh, as my colleagues can attest to, even though we're working with youth, we sometimes experience our own humiliation. We sometimes experience our own trauma doing this work. Uh, we, 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 it's, some of this work is triggering for us because of our own uh, experiences as BIPOC people. So what this group this year for me has been a a, a, a safe space too to, to, to grapple with this with, with some fellow BIPOC leaders. And then uh, the other thing is uh, how much I learned from these, these other groups uh, that validated some of what we do at Facing History and Ourselves, but also to raise the bar at some of what, I, of what we're doing. I was so impressed with, with ways in which uh, my colleagues on this panel in so many ways made space for youth and in and, and ways in which we can learn from. So I, I learned so much. So it was also a, a uh, humbling experience, experience as well. Thank you, Steve. Mm -hmm. um, I can uh, follow up with Steve. Definitely the, af the affirmation uh, of the work that we're doing to, to see in depth. And um, many of the organizations are organizations I've known. I think, uh, David, you had a moment of calling me Exalt because I've worked at Exalt previously prior to coming, well, between coming to Urban Word in multiple different uh, decades. But uh, I think there was just a collective consciousness that we were able to flesh out. And, and that was really helpful for us to find community in that, in, in the way that we nurture the young people we serve and the way that um, we approach this work uh, 
with the willingness to learn from the young people as we're building. And I think that just seeing the way that everyone did that in their own special way and, and also the intersections of that um, was just really empowering and really uh, gave us, yeah, definitely gave me a lot to go back to my staff with like, hey, I have an idea. Um, and I think that that sharing, um, while a lot of our organizations, some of us are getting funded by the same uh, foundations, we are mm-hmm. still like sharing this conversation and sharing kind of peer sharing uh, some best practices with each other, um, as well as collectively with all of you that are watching now. Yeah, I, you know, I, what both um, Steve and Chanel shared is, is really powerful. And I feel like, you know, I'm thinking about the fact that at Sadie Nash, one of the practices that our program team has is uh, after each um, program, af- after each like, you know, activity uh, class that happens, there's a praxis document that they return to. And that is really the time for you to, you know, be your most vulnerable self as a educator, <laughs> kind of, you know, coming in with, these are the questions I had, this is what I thought went well, but these are the places where maybe I could have done better. And you're really like, processing through what you could improve on and how you felt and your your feelings and how it's impacting you is real information and data in that space and it helps you in this really like space where you're held like improve and 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 get better and I think that oftentimes as organizations we are having to prove our worth in spaces that are, you know, where we're feeling like it's not already a given that it's, it is worth it and we are worth it and our young people are worth it, right? Um, But to be able to be a critical thinker, to be asking hard questions, to be putting ourselves out there in a a vulnerable way to our peers who really want the best for us, right? And want the best for our organizations and want to hear the, you know, want to hear the challenges so they can help detangle them with us, like in, in, you know, with love, really. (laughs) Um, I think it it was really powerful to be able to kind of be in that kind of space, this community of practice where we are detangling together. And it's not like I'm coming and just being like, here are all the beautiful, amazing things that we do. Sure. There are plenty of beautiful, amazing things that I could talk to you for the rest of the year about. And there's also places of difficulty and there's Mm -hmm. places where we're we're, we're digging in. And so I think it felt like a real gift to be able to sit in the space where, exam, where we're examining all of those things truthfully and with love for ourselves, our organizations, our young people, our staff. Um, that felt like a really important takeaway just for you know the funders out there as well to, to think about how do you create those kind of real spaces for us to continually be in learning together to you know to work to improve so mm-hmm. thank you um and thank you dr david kirkland for inviting us and inviting it all to be part of this one year journey of learning together of really sharing our rich experiences you know, some of my takeaway has been and i didn't um, attend alone you know to some of the conversations we came in with one of our young people we came in with um, you know, staff who are doing the work on a day-to-day basis. And this happened during COVID. This happened during, you know, the virtual platform. This also happened during we enter a hybrid model. And there's always this happened at the core when we were thinking about our young people. Uh, for the audience who are listening, you know, to us this afternoon, at Exalt, we work with young people who are impacted by the juvenile justice system, court-involved youth. And we work with the three interrelated you know, areas that we have to work to move our young people forward, which is education, employability, and alleviating that burden of potential incarceration and being in community and talking about the challenges that we have as professionals and practitioners, thinking through our youth who were, although enrolled in school, many of them were not in school and having you know, this discussion of not what's happening presently, but about the future has been rich, rewarding, and I can't thank you all enough, you know, for um, sharing your practices as we know it today, but also there was a consistent theme that I think that happens when people of color come together, where we get to feel the power, the force, and also the way that we tap into our young people's brilliance, our brilliance as well, believing that the future, um, we will have an opportunity to rewrite it. So thank you so much for this opportunity and for inviting um, 
I'll jump in and all this goodness and brilliance and beautiful people. I just, what an extraordinary uh, journey this has been of folks of kindred spirit um, where love really was ran through all, runs through all of us in service of, of our children. I think for me, um, I just got to go back again. Yo, the Calvary ain't coming to show, uh, to, to save anybody. We are the enchanted people we've been waiting on. And so when you can get into even virtual spaces of like-minded, like-spirited folk, um, we have the answers. We, we already know what we need to know to eliminate the achievement gap, to accelerate academic performance, but really it is a will. And so for me, the, the beauty and the blessing of being um, in collaboration with all of you, uh, in particular, David Kirkland with your vision and, and uh, man, just always impressed um, by your leadership and sister TT and Gates and everybody is is the narrative though. Um, we need to lift this up. Well, all of the folk in these places and spaces and what we do every day is the norm. Um, as opposed to the prop, kind of the problematic, uh, the deficit-minded approach. Like we have all that we need. And so I, for me, it was learning about brothers and sisters throughout the diaspora in this nation that are doing work and showing up every day. And so I carry their legacy forward. And so this opportunity gave me an opportunity just to you know, learn about some of that goodness and genius um, and excited about what we, we, what we do moving forward. And so uh, just appreciated the opportunity over this time um, to be aligned and um, yeah, and move forward. So thank you again, uh, Brother David and others. Thank you, thank you so much, Chris. You know, um, so now that we got, you know, niceties out the way, I wanna jump into the real question. Right, I got you, and then I'll open it up. You know, I'm for the audience. Brother Chris said that we have the answers. Right, we we understand how to teach our babies. We understand how to close the disparities that we see in education, from special education placement to suspension to um, graduation rates, achievement, all of these things. Where we see these kind of vicious disparities that articulate a narrative of education. We understand that. In fact, last year, you know, I'm close to $68 billion worldwide was, um, was invested in education, in education solutions. And if we, if we multiply that by time and space, we're talking about an uncountable, unknowable amount of money invested in education, directly in education solutions. Chris says that we got the answers. Well, our babies are still failing. What's going on? What's wrong? What do you all see when you get our babies into your organizations? that you're trying to resolve. What is wrong? If we got the answers, why aren't we using them? Dude, well, yeah, straight up, white supremacy outlives all of us. So we, we are trying to educate in the system, structure, condition, and culture of Eurocentricity and whiteness. So I just say that with all graciousness, yeah, we know what to do, um, yet the dismantling of these institutions uh, and the sort of fugitive pedagogy that we are putting place is legacy work. And so um, they are outnumbered. <laughs> the system outlives. It was uh, cultivated, perpetuated. And so we have this opportunity to deconstruct and redesign. But I say lovingly, that does take time and extraordinary revolution that at the foundation is love. And so I have faith um, that, yeah, we're going to do it, but it, yeah, but it is, it's not just, it's not a plug and play. Uh, it's not a turnkey. Um, and the tide is, I mean, like it or not, the tide is changing. Um, so I'll start big picture knowing that this, this precedes all of us, but this sort of approach to fugitive pedagogy that all of us embody does take time to deconstruct, redesign and create an entire ecology where there is no inequity. Um, and so we haven't seen that in this country, and we are the curators of that, uh, that will come. That's just, you know, that history tells us and her story tells us that those at the top will uh, at some point uh, be excused to those who are moving their way up to the top. And that's uh, with the, the folks in these squares, um, uh, you know, dedicated their lives to. So I'll start with that and, and uh, looking forward to listening. Sure, I'll add um, to that question, which is a great one. It's like, you know, what, what happens and if we are the answer? Why are we having such challenges? You know, and I'm going to 
add to what you know Christopher said. You know, when we think about our young people at Exalt, and you, we have thousands and thousands of young people who come in through the system, and there's data that says that young people who enter the criminal justice system are functionally illiterate. You know, the question is like, how? Like, how is it that you have thousands of young people, and then at Exalt they come in and they do extraordinarily well. What this is, is that we finally are creating models created by people of color, um, people of color teaching uh, our young people and then being able to see how quickly and rapidly we have young people love learning. But it is, you know, what we were have been talking about, the traditional learning that we can then see a different set of data, which is the academic, you know, data. So with time, I think that with rigor, with also the spirit of tenacity, but then also really understanding that there are strategies here because to dismantle the system, there's also this education, but there's also making sure that we have as many young people for us at Exalt who walk in through our doors and are able to choose the life that they want and be successful in the life that they want to choose and live in. And then the other big one is ensuring that this model that we have, this spirit in this community, you know, Dr. David Kirkland and as we mentioned, you know, TT and the Gates Foundation created for us, that this continues to move forward because there will continue to be learning. You know, the other thing that we kept saying was, what happens now when our young people return back to school into their academic setting when they have been traumatized in ways that we all have been traumatized you know, through COVID? But then the big question is, is this an opportunity for us to push forward and then how? So I would say that we are unfortunately with all the, the drama and I'm gonna close out with this one, God knows when I start to talk, I can't stop. But I think about the point you know, when the George Floyd you know, sentencing occurred, we were together. And I think that we were gripping and we were holding our breath, not because of the sentence, but what would happen post sentence, which we began to see you know, something else. So then there's this question of like, are we resilient? Yes and no, but what is it that we do to create and build community when now we finally are in a place, we have the platform to educate, to advance young people, but yet there is going to be the relentless challenges that we are confronted with. So the question is pretty complex, but I think that, you know, the answer is that, that we are getting there. Um, and thank you for that great question. I really appreciated it. Steve. It is an amazing, great question. Thank you. Uh, and my colleagues that just uh, ditto everything they said. And I would add that the conversation, the real conversation, like the question you just raised, David, the real conversation that needs to happen even among the people that call themselves progressive, that call themselves liberal, that call themselves on the right side of equity, is that if, if, if we do not, and I'm including us, all of us, if we do not constantly ask ourselves, are we reinscribing white supremacy even in our way of meaning work? That, that we have to remain critically conscious because this these things are so deeply embedded. If you were educated, socialized in a Western uh, Eurocentric construct, uh, it's not so much to look at other folks, but a continuous uh, self-analysis of what you're doing and that if you are unintentionally and unconsciously Reinscribing uh, uh, white supremacy in the work that you're doing, and then the the other piece to those that are on this side of the work, the the funders out there who fund this work. I've had too many experiences where I've gone to, to funders who are on the right side of this, want to be on the right side of this, to say, you know what, uh, we're here's what really matters. It's not just math school. Here's what really matters to these children's outcomes. Well, if you can't raise math scores, then you haven't proven that your program worked. I mean, funders have to get in the mess with us and, and to see how messy this is. And we don't always have these linear uh, uh, sort of on a pie chart measure to what it means to dismantle a system of oppression that are a part of the, the very fabric of our, of our nation. Outstanding. Outstanding. And, um, <clears throat> I was going to add, I think, um, because uh, for us specifically, we do a lot of work in school, um, in residencies and programs with teaching artists. 
going into schools, teaching poetry, teaching hip hop, and using that to foster um, space for conversations, as well as giving uh, a lot of times giving educators space to see the humanity of their students, right? Um, and 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 I can't I can count on I can't even count on my hands how many times teachers have seen the work that have come out of students that they previously said were functionally literate or below level or reading at under level or just just not engage with school how many times we've seen young people uh show up and show out and show who they are and the, and the brilliance that they have and so I, I think we um we just constantly have to keep asking ourselves these questions and answer finally answer the question you know where is our heart where does our where does our treasure lie are we valuing just like like Stephen mentioned are we valuing just the numbers the data or are we valuing the human experiences? And um, I think um, for Urban Word, and I think for all of our organizations, uh, a lot of young people say that this feels like home, this feels safe, or this feels, mm -hmm. you know, those things. a big part of that is because we're, we're our treasure, we know that our treasure cannot lie in the, in, in the statistical measurements, right? It has to lie in, in, in what, the young people um, need, mm -hmm. what they show us that they need, as opposed to what we um, tell them that they need to be doing. And how do we look at the things that they're doing and find the transferable skills in there that can help them transition out of some of the situations they're in into, into other worlds that they cannot even imagine or that other people, the schools, um, sometimes their families have not imagined for them either. Mm -hmm. What are the ways mm -hmm. that they transcend? And I think that us, instead of trying to put young people in these boxes that we're told they have to fit in. We, um, we, we help reimagine what those, like we let them take the boxes out. Like, okay, you yeah. like poems, where can we go with that? Oh, you like just being a leader. Like, wow, you're, you're hosting. Maybe you should learn how to host your own events. Like all of these things are all skills that end up leading them to successful spaces later on. Mm -hmm. And now, excuse me. <laughs> Yeah, I'll just ditto everything. I wrote something in the <clears throat> chat, but just, you know, I'm thinking back to, uh, uh, as we had our conversations, um, the idea of ecosystems and our, and our connection, our deep connection to one another, not just as organizations, but in our communities, like would come up over and over again. And I, you know, I, uh, uh, Brother Chris and Kingmakers, you know, use that ecosystem, you know, uh, the, the talking about the fish in the pond, that metaphor to really think about it. But I think it's really important. Part of what has, you know, has to shift is that there are so many parts of how we understand our young people's growth and development that is like siloed in, in understanding that it's not like we have to work in Congress. We have to be, we have to understand the ecosystem that they're living in and that we're living in, recognize the systems that are impacting that and creating unsafe spaces for us and not just act like one by one or not just be like, oh, we got one young person out or we got them here. But like, what does it really mean to be um, in community healing? What does it really mean to be in community and supporting not just one person's growth and development, but the, the growth and development of our, you know, the ecosystem that our young people are in. And so I think that that's a huge shift <laughs> that has to, you know, that, that needs to happen. Understanding we're not doing this singularly, uh, but that we are like, we need to move together. Um, we're not, you know, we're not free till everybody's free, like nobody is, right? So um, yeah, I think that that's an important piece of what we spent a lot of time thinking about as well. I love that, Tanae, I love it so much. We got, we got less than 10 minutes. We got about eight minutes left with this panel. So please put your question you know, um, in the chat or use the Q&A feature on Zoom. Um, I'll take your question. I may have time to take one or two depending on how much time, but I do think the answer to the, you know, kind of like the tough question. You know, and it's a serious question because so much money, so much attention has been placed on solutions and education. And to me, it seemed like we've gotten very, I mean, we haven't gotten far, right? You know, and I think that you all provide three kinds of answers, you know, um, and, and they're reiterated in the, um, in the study that we did. You know, one is what Chris said, is that we have to, we have to frame the problem, right? 
the extent to which we can get the right answer, right? So if the question is, how do we succeed all of our students? We gotta frame the right question. Why aren't we succeeding all of our students? And I think Chris, as well as Steve, you know, I'm just said it, and it's not comfortable to say, is that we live in a system of white supremacy and white supremacy articulates, right, our divisions. You know, um, this disdain for some certain bodies and this, you know, um, joy or love or overprivilege of particular bodies that articulates every side of the divide. Right, and, and until we're able to comfortably articulate and say it, we may, we're not gonna get anywhere. I think Tanae said the other piece is that we have to go together. There's an African proverb that said, it says, if you wanna go fast, go alone, but if you wanna go far, go together. And we wanna go far, and yet we haven't gone together. Like so often we work in silos. So that first question I asked you about, what does it mean to be together in this space was meaningful, right? Because there is a recognition that not only do we bear wounds, we bear those wounds in silence. And it's that silence that keeps, you know, um, this mechanism, this system in place. And I think the kind of third answer, you know, um, in that Chanel and, you know, um, Giselle kind of gave us was that, you know, there's a question about who we value and how we value them. Right. Mm -hmm. When will we make it normal to value and love, you know, um, black, brown, indigenous, multilingual learner, um, otherly able, you know, um, et cetera, children, right? Can that be the sentence? Those three things, those three nuggets explains a way. If we have all the solutions, this is the incredible wall blocking us. And so mm -hmm. how can we tear down that wall? Do we have any questions from audience? And if we have no questions, I wanna give you all an opportunity. I don't see any questions in the um, Q&A, nor do I see questions in the chat. I wanna give you all an opportunity to leave us with, you know, a last word. One last indelible message, you know, it could be about the experience or it could be that you want us to take, you know, um, leaving this experience. What is one message that you would leave us with? I like to use my one message to lift, lift up Chanel, urban word, what Chanel said, and that's giving young people uh, the language, the tools, the space to deconstruct these systems themselves. There is no people ever who've gotten free by not participating in their own liberation. So how do we empower students to participate in their own liberation? Thank you for lifting that, Chanel. Who wants to go next? Don't be so bad. There are so many words. It's it's hard to you know be be as uh, clear and concise with the language. But um, I I think that um, the the thing that's coming to to mind for me is like uh, just love and cherish and care for young people, right? That idea of community care first. And, you know, it's like the love and the cherish is, is, is there, it gets woven into a lot of places, but first, that's the first thing you do um, is really create the space for love and care for the young people in that space. I think if you start with that always, it just, you know, it leads you to wherever else you need to go. Um, the content will come, the critical consciousness will come, it's all, it will be there, but start with love. Love that. Ashe, I'll jump in. Um, a, a couple sprinkles and just love all this, uh, I just love the dialogue, y'all. Uh, one, we, we have to stop letting white supremacy dictate what the metrics of success look like. Um, Brother David, you hit it on the head, the metric of success is the measurement of the be of belonging. Once I once I was able to take my crown out my pocket, the only thing stopping me is me. Meaning, once our kings and queens know who and whose they are, they, they ain't ready for that. Um, so let's stop letting these public institutions define what the metrics of success are, and we define the metrics of success. Full stop. Which leads me into the the next one. Whoever controls the narrative has the power, y'all. You are so beautiful, brilliant, beyond measure. Do, we got to get out of the problem and elevate the promise. Y'all just stay in. Stay in the asset model. Stay in all of what you do every day because they're not ready for that because the present culture is toxic. 
the, the, the cure should be in our culture of genius, of beauty, of knowing who and whose we are. That to me, y'all, yeah, that, yeah, the, the system is not ready for that because um, we operate on a different ether. In, the, in white supremacy, we have muscles and, and technology that we haven't even tapped into because that by design, the structure uh, doesn't allow us to plug in. So know who and whose you are. Don't use the metrics of the oppressor to define your self-worth and your genius and then operate in genius. Tell the beautiful narrative of how bad and awesome and beautiful and extraordinary our people are. Drop the mic, hit mute. <laughs> mic drop. <laughs> I'll follow that. I mean, I don't know how to follow that, but uh, I'll just say for me, I think the thing is, uh, and um, I guess this piggybacks off it's uh, off of today. Um, just focusing on the young people. I think sometimes it's easy to get caught up in the politics that we as administrators, as educators, have to deal with. That can really, really uh, be disheartening and discouraging for the work that we're all doing. Um, all of the other things that have nothing to do with the, the the amazing young people that we serve. That we have to do it. Sometimes we get so caught up in that work that we forget like what our practice is, what our focus is, what our where our heart is, right? And um and just sometimes I've I've had those moments where I'm burnt out and I'm like, what's burning me out is not the, the kids. Like it's not the young people. It's not that. And so um I get to steal away and and anytime as much as I do all of the the behind the desk work, if you can, if you're one of those people that do a lot of the work behind the scenes please take the time to get in front of those young people. Like that's something that if I am tired, I'm going to try to show up to an event that I might not need to be there for because it's my staff is amazing, but I'm like, no, I want to meet who's there. And that's what re-energizes me and always brings the joy back into the work that I do. Thank you. I would say that if I could leave like a word, um, you know, thinking about Exalt, we work with young people ages 15 through 19, the average age during this COVID has been 16, which means that by the time that we started um, this community of practice, they're all 17. When we understand time, time goes by very quickly for a young adolescent that is developing. So making sure that we're creating the best vibrant opportunity and creating thriving environments so they could blow our minds because they typically do. Um, you know, if one day we see them on paper, meaning young people who are coming in through Exalt, that someone will then say, mm, not too sure they should be given freedom. And then having our young people take freedom and like literally like blowing it out the park, I would say our responsibility is creating the best thriving environment for our young people. Thank you so much, Giselle. G give this panel um, just a round of applause, please. Thank you so much for everything that you do. Um, we've had a tremendous opportunity to learn from you, to love you, and I hope that we stay connected. I hope that we stay in touch. In fact, we will, because we got a lot of work to do together. Thank you all so much you know, for everything that you do. Um, heeding Steve Beckton's call, we want to hear from young people. Throughout this process, we've been guided by, you know, just the visionary voices of young people, our youth advisory board, who looked at data, who helped us to beg better and brighter questions, who led us in so many ways, you know, um, in doing this work. And so you're going to hear from, you know, um, Elise, Dr. Elise Wil um, Harris Wilkerson, you know, who helped lead the project, as well as Aman Abdul, who helped to direct, you know, um, our lead, our youth. Um, advisory board to give us feedback and tremendous wisdom that came from young people. We can't say that we're studying solutions about them without including them. There is no way. Um, and so we included them and in we in what we think is a very innovative way, you know, um, as equals and beyond that as advisors to help us understand the kinds of questions we should ask, the ways that we should be looking for, searching for solutions to help us see what wasn't there you know, um, and to help us to see what was there. At this time, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues. Um, it's your floor. All right. So I'm so excited to share um, and be a part of this part of the presentation. It, was, it has been an honor to work alongside um, Iman Abdul to lead and cultivate and structure the Youth Advisory Board. So I'm gonna let Iman, who is a dynamic organizer, activist, youth leader, 
um, just sort of take it away and explain to you all the purpose and what we did over the last seven months with a dynamic group of young people who are from across the nation. So Iman, do you want to take it away? It does sound good. All right, I'm sorry for any background noise. Um, but okay, so we're gonna just start with the table of contents so I could just briefly uh, let you guys know what we're gonna be talking about. So we're going to be talking about uh, what is the YAB? What is the youth component in this overall research? Who is the YAB? Who are the young people that are involved? What we've done, who's presented to the YAB, the topics and conversations that were highlighted. And at the end, we're just gonna end it with some youth pieces, some art, um, videos and collage in a collage from our youth advisory board. So we'll start with what is the YAB? Elise, would you like to do this one? Sure, absolutely. So when you think about what is the YAB and the, the, the goal of the YAB is to bring young people um, from a range of places across the nation to really help us think through some important research questions and be literal advisors to our group. Young people um, have a wealth of knowledge as you all have heard from the panelists and that bear out in the research. And so what we needed to do, we wanted to make sure that our work um, was reflective and was checked by students, people who are actually experiencing school and have a lot to say about culturally responsive and sustaining education. So our goal was to create community dialogue and opportunities for moral growth. Um, our goal was to liberate new ways of thinking about our work in relation to Black, Latinx, and economically less advantaged students. Um, our goal was to think about how an anti-racist school might look and function and how our work can play and act a role in building that. And again, our, our goal was to, uh, for them to be an essential uh, part and have an essential experience um, in advising a research team and understanding how culturally responsive and sustaining solutions can inform the needs of students, um, whether that's high school students and even, you know, we also have some college students as well. So they were definitely important advisors to how we thought about um, our research. Thank you so much. Okay, so now we're going to get into who is the YAB. So the Youth Advisory Board comprises of 14 students from across the country that represent different ages, ethnicities, genders, sexualities, and religious identities. Students also attend different forms of schooling, being they attend screen schools, universities, zoned schools, charter schools, private schools, etc. Um, so we meet virtually on Thursdays from 7 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time. And we've met 10 times so far throughout the year since May, and we only have two more sessions left to go together. Um, so our, this is a list of our youth advisory board members. They come from all across the country, um, and these are their ages. So we'll briefly, just have Amina, Ashley, Bentuna, Dion, Gracie, Hashim, Irene, Malia, Meram, Sarah, Tyranny, Wilkins, Zio, and Zahara. And this is where they come from. Um, so we have students that are coming from Washington, from California, from Texas, Georgia, Maryland, Washington, DC, Jersey, New York, um, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts. So a pretty diverse range of people. Um, so what we've done, so actually on our first meeting, uh, us young people, we created our community agreements. And this is what our young folks um, came up with and agreed to on their first day and have practiced that in every single meeting and hopefully have carried on those practices outside of their meetings as well. So what we've discussed, so every single meeting would start with an icebreaker to get the energy flowing for our young people. Gather Round was their favorite. I don't know if anybody has used that platform before, but it's a really, really fun platform uh, to kind of break the ice and get young people to have direct dialogue, so definitely recommend it. Um, but anyway, so throughout the year, the YAB met with our researchers and team members to dissect and deep dive interview and observation protocols and artifacts. They were given the space to also reflect in multiple, in multiple capacities on matters that have impacted their own personal identity formation and overall schooling. 
And now we'll end it with some youth pieces. So we have a video uh, put together by the amazing Tiffany Martinez, who's on our research team. Um, but this is all created by our young folks um, who have submitted these videos and have answered two prompts for us. Yes, and we would be remiss. So of course, we invited them to attend today. Um, however, since these young people, some of them are in high school, they're in classes, some of them are in college, we got folks all the way, y'all saw folks were all the way from the West Coast. So one to three Eastern Standard Time had, was a challenge for many of our students, but we wanted to ensure that their voice was represented here because they played such an important role um, in our project. And so we have a video here and they're responding to two questions. One is, you know, what is what is culturally responsive and sustaining education mean to you? And then two, what does it mean to serve on the YAB? So what does it mean for you to serve, to be a member of a youth advisory board that advises a research team around culturally responsive and sustaining education? Putting a student's identity at the center of their learning. I don't have to look outside of school to find like these very important figures in my history. It would all be included. It means that in schools, teachers and administrators go into each space that they're in thinking about race and ethnicity. Our identity and our culture really shapes how we learn and our societal perceptions and experiences. And that's why it's so much more important that our identity be incorporated in our learning. To me, it means being able to have an education where all students feel comfortable with the class setting, as well as motivated and confident in their learning. It promotes giving students a voice in what they learn and how they learn it. Having CRC will also allow students to have their identities affirmed. They will have the chance to express themselves in their truest forms within the classroom. And the student is able to engage more in the classroom and school doesn't feel like so much of a burden anymore. For me, the key part about culturally responsive sustaining education is that it is sustaining. CRSE is not a one and done, but rather it is something that will stick with you throughout your life. And to me, CRSE means complete diversity because our education is not diverse. For centuries, it has been in the perspective of the same people. Our country is made up of so many people of different colors genders, ethnicities, sexuality. Our history is more than just white men. It encourages not only the acknowledgement of, but the appreciation for students' unique identities and individuality within the classroom. For me, it was absolutely incredible because we were able to connect people from all around the country, people who had different ages, genders, sexual orientations, and races, and we were able to bring connections. Despite all of our differences, we were able to bring connections and realize we all wanted the same thing in the classroom, which is to be able to relate to what we were learning. Being a YAB member, it meant that we were being heard, but I also felt like I was making an actual difference. Like I feel like this project will make a difference. It was amazing to be a part of it. I hope that my contributions within the YAP team can help students who look like me and students who don't look like me feel more welcomed, accepted, and celebrated within their learning environments. Experience. I've had the opportunity each month to meet with a group of passionate, intelligent, thought-provoking students to hear about their experiences and to also share mine. Being a YAB member means that I have a voice, and even though my peers don't have the opportunity, hopefully in the far future, my voice and my input will allow people to have the opportunities that I didn't get to have. I was able to meet with people from all across the country who were equally as passionate about creating education and curriculum reform in schools as I was. I think it was a really valuable experience. I had the opportunity to be a part of a research that will help create a new way of learning for students and teachers in a culturally safe environment, and I was honored to be a YAB member. To be a YAB member has meant to become more aware of my, more aware of my school's administrations and the way that my school system is set up. Through YAB, I've gained hope again towards being able to see change within schools around the world. It makes me feel like I shouldn't lose all hope and should continue to strive towards social change.
Yes, and then we have a collage um, put together by our students and uh, the prompt was for them to just gather images that reflected them and their power through identity, community, their dream schools and etc. cetera. Um, and this is what they submitted. And I just think it is so beautiful and an amazing reflection of our students, where their minds at, where they are driven to strive towards. Um, and just, you know, very embracing of their identities, their backgrounds. Um, and I think it's just so powerful and it made me really, really happy uh, when I saw this all put together because it's a beautiful reflection of them. And yeah. That's, that's what we have. Thank you. Yes, and I agree with some folks in the chat. Um, the YAB was, is filled with brilliance. These are some really dynamic young people who provided really important insights around research questions, how to order them. I mean, they were in the nitty gritty with some of our um, research um, questions, protocols, things of that nature. And then not only were they advisors, but we gave them an opportunity for themselves to process around their own experiences. And Iman and her amazing work had set them up really, really well to be able to not only advise us, but to process their own experiences, to talk about, learn about culturally responsible and sustaining education, talk about schooling practices and integration, segregation, desegregation. I mean, it's been just an amazing time with young people. So thank you all for um, listening to us. And I'm so glad that we were able to share a bit about the advisory board with you all. Um, so at this point, we are going to turn it over to just general questions um, of you all. So we're in the question and answer session of today's webinar. So Dr. Kirkland, do I want to, do we want to turn it back over to Dr. Kirkland? Well, let's give, let's give people an opportunity to ask some questions. If you all have um, questions, please raise those questions via chat or raise those questions using a Q&A. There is one question from Jeffrey Sigler, you know, I'm addressed directly to me, Dr. Kirkland, how can we financially support these tremendous organizations? Giving Tuesday is coming up November 30th. Thank you for the reminder, Jeffrey. Giving Tuesday, um, Tuesday is coming up November 30th. Please reach out and support all of the organizations and our young people as much as, as, much as you possibly can. Any other questions? They can be about the YAB or just general questions about the research or um, anything else. I do want to just say, you know, um, I feel a, a tremendous privilege having, you know, been on a project where young people are not only centered, but, you know, that they contribute and they don't contribute as, you know, um, as subordinates within the process, you know, um, but equals. We listened to them, we learned from them, we valued every piece of wisdom, you know, um, that they brought to the table. And as you could see, these young people were extremely sophisticated, are extremely sophisticated, knowledgeable, and we believe deeply that those who are closest to the problem are closest to the solution, that they are solution makers, solution builders. And I think that Chris wrote it, said it best when he talked about controlling the narrative until the lion learns to write history, the story of the jungle where forever glorifies hunter. It's important you know, um, to, you know, kind of not, not only put people in positions where they can narrate their own history on their own terms, but do so with the grace that Aman, Elise, and these young people are able to do it with. Thank you so much for your tremendous work. So we have a few questions in the question A um, chat box. And so there was a question about how will um, the YAB sort of continue to be a part of this work. And so um, I wrote it in the chat, but just so folks can know, we have about two more meetings with them. One is actually this Thursday, um, and we're gonna be sharing our findings with them. And again, they're going to reflect back their thoughts on what we presented. Is it representative? Is it not? What are we missing? How can we continue to think deeply about this work, right? So we're going to share everything with them. I don't think they've seen the video or the collage yet, so I'm excited to show it to them. Um, they, I'm sure they will be thrilled to see it all. So we have another question about, was there any conversation in any organization about 
how BIPOC youth are defining their blackness or minority status? And I'm not sure if that's just a general question or about YAB, but Aman, do you wanna talk about that through the YAB? Yeah, I can speak about that through the YAB. Do you mind just re, re saying the question just so I could answer it correctly? Sure, let me make sure I can find it again. Um, pretty much it was a question about, uh, and our young people talking about their blackness in the, in the work, in the organizations. Um, yeah, in the organizations. I, I think the question went away. I'm not sure, but anyway, it's can you just answer? That? It's in the answer um, section of the Q&A. Oh, okay. Okay, got it. Was there any conversation in this organization about how BIPOC youth are defining their blackness or minority status? Thank you, David. Um, yes, thank you for that question. Um, so specifically in YAB, there definitely has been, I think every single conversation has been uh, where students are asked to reflect on their identities um, and how do they imagine to empower themselves furthermore in a classroom setting and, and outside of school as well. And so we have like allowed students to journal, to jot down, to do breakout rooms and discuss amongst each other. Um, how do they wanna be seen in a school setting and what does it look like to, I'm sorry, and what does culturally responsive sustaining education look like for, the, for them in terms of defining their blackness or defining their Latino status, Native American status, et cetera. Um, so yeah, I would say that we have provided a lot of opportunities for young people to reflect. Um, and you could even see like, it's pretty present in the collage where it's very identity heavy, uh, very identity heavy um, and they have seen themselves in many spaces beyond what the status quo has has told them to settle for. And so, yeah, hope that answers. So Tanae asked a question, she would love to hear what are some next steps we can all take to continue this important conversation. So I know we have all of our research team here and we'll open that up to anybody who wants to take that, but um, just any thoughts on what are some next steps we can all take to continue this important work? Can I respond? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I guess like, because everybody, you know, does different things. So I would say like, if you are just a young person or a person that is interested in education reform, or um, I would say specifically like, yeah, education reform or integrating schools, um, continue this work by having these conversations, by allowing workshops to be held in your schools or in your community centers, by having children in your classrooms or children at home or children in your family talking about these things, right? Asking the, the kids around you, like, how do they want to see themselves in school? And does school actually support their, their identities and where they come from? And having young people to really like put themselves in that perspective where, oh my God, I have the power to control what I'm learning. I have the power to control the environment I am learning in and giving students and young people that power to feel like they can actually do it. And I mean, I am a product of that. I am a product of New York City's public schools and I have been always encouraged and reminded that it is my within my identity and my power to control and influence other young people, administrators, school advisors to make sure that my curriculum reflects multiple identities or to make sure that there's an equitable amount of sports teams in a school. And just thinking about equity and identity in different ways, um, just having this conversation and centering young people. I think those are the two things because we cannot have this conversation without the young people that we are educating and impacting. And I think that's often a huge disconnect because there's often a lot of adults talking about it. There are no young folks in the room and so, always is always here for the intergenerational learning and conversations. Thank you, Iman. Okay, I think that's our question and answer session. Dr. David Kirk, I'll turn it back over to you to close us out. 
Well, there, there is one more question and it's addressed to Amon. Um, and I want Amon to have an opportunity, you know, to answer it. It's from um, TT. And you'll hear a, a little bit more about TT in a second. Um, for Amon, how was the experience of being part of the large research, a large research project, you know, um, is carried out? So how was it being part of this research project fee is what TT is asking, I believe. Being a part of this research project, and thank you for this question, TT. Um, being a part of this research project honestly has given me a lot of faith in myself that I feel I didn't necessarily have before. Um, I realized a lot of like my power and I feel as a young person, I often forget how impactful I can be towards other young people. Um, and I was often reminded that during throughout this YAB and I was able to learn from um, educators and professionals that represent me and my multiple identities. Um, and it was very, very impactful to my learning and encouraging to me to wanna continue doing this education reform work. Um, I've been doing work around public school integration for the past six years. Um, and so this is just like a continuation of um, bringing that impact and being that voice for our young people. And I think that this research team was just so beautifully coordinated and such a powerful team of leaders. And yes, I'm just grateful to be a part of this. Thank you. Thank you so much, you know, um, for that, you know, um, Aman, thank you so much team, you know, for what you're, what you're doing. Um, before we go, we have one more video to show and then I wanna wrap up with some thank yous. So please stay around for the thank yous. Um, but Lindsay, you know, you can go ahead and play the video. It's power in that pain. My mama says I'm a blessing. The stains in my city, the residue of oppression. Neighborhoods full of melanin settling. I'm a resident. My ancestors are guiding me and it's evident. I'm reassured by our perspective. Inspired by our story. That these feet bleed from years of running towards glory. We know where we are. Liberation is mandatory. For centuries we've been calling for a revolution. It's coming. At what point is enough enough? They killing babies still inside their mother's uterus. A black man with his hands cuffed, his neck crushed. Another shot in his stomach with two hands up. To relay the violence, but can I forget the scene? Another mother crying, wishing God would intervene. Guess we gotta teach them how to survive before we teach them how to live their dreams. What being black in America means? It's sick, ain't it? Graffiti gravestones got the whole city painted. Walking down the street to concrete, having conversations. I'm trying to understand my place in the world so cruel. Is it 20? 20 or 1962. Keep on telling myself things will get better. If you rub it through the storm, bound to reach warmer weather. It's more taxing by yourself. Okay. So we wanted to share that video just so you can get another um, sense for seeing um, of the kind of work that the organizations that we learned from, you know, um, are doing. Their young people are making videos. They're writing poetry, reciting poetry. They're um, national poet laureates. They are, you know, um, individuals who have been systems involved, who graduate high school, who go on to work. They are girls who have experienced some form of violence, but beyond the violence, they have found ways to persist in their sisterhood, you know, collect it together. They are curriculum makers. They are training teachers how to teach our young people using the material that come out of their lives, interrupting you know, um, a curricular curriculum of white supremacy, decolonizing not just the structures that oppress us and chain us together. They are the revolutionaries and we appreciate the opportunity we've had to be with them. Before I let you go, I got some thank yous that I wanna say in public and I wanna say their names. You've heard a name and you've heard it over and over and over again today. The name is TT and without TT, there would not have been an event. I wanna thank TT Harley. Um, from the Gates Foundation for the keen investment in this work. 
This work was Titi's idea. She came to me and she said, we want to study solutions. And she said, Professor Kirkland, can we study solutions with you? Um, her partner in crime, I want to thank Akila Allen, you know, um, also at the Gates Foundation for coming to us to do this amazing work. Thank you, TT. Thank you, Akila, so much for everything that you have done, for your wisdom, for your work, for your investment. Also need to thank, you know, um, my partner in crime, the person who managed this project from the start to the finish. Dr. Elise Harris Wilkerson is amazing. Our youth leader, our youth advisory board leader, excuse me, Aman Abdul, thank you. Our research team, Dr. Wendy Perez, Sarah McAllister, Lindsay Foster, Dr. Cecilia Parthner, um, Dr. Kelly um, Giplin, Tiffany Martinez, um, Sydney Miller, thank you all so much for everything that you've done, for your research, for your work, for your wisdom, for your brilliance. We want to thank our Youth Advisory Board, every member within it, Amina, Ashley, Bantuna, Dion, Grizzly, Hashim, Hashim, Irene, Milia, Marin, Sarah, T T um, Tierney, Will, Will Genus, excuse me, Zia, Zahara, forgive me if I messed up any names. And of course, we want to thank our organization, our organization leaders, all the people who are present with us, Chris Chapman, Kingmakers of Oakland, Pam Donaldson, Isabel Rodriguez, Lopez, Steve Becton, Facing History, Tanae Howard, Jessica Fee, um, Sadie Nash, um, um, Giselle Castro, Brian Lewis, Exalt Youth, Chanel Gabriel, Michael Sorelli, Urban Word NYC, and we thank each of you for showing up. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you so much, and have a great, great Monday.